So I'm told um, that now that I've been here for about four years, I know that littering is not allowed in Singapore, but I'm going to do some littering on stage. I've got lots of cards, and I have no place to throw them, so I'm going to do that here. Uh, I hope it's a safe space, Jen. <laughs> so, so what's uh, very often I'm asked that uh, a, a, a graduate from a premier business school, uh, what's he doing screenwriting? What, what attracted me to screenwriting? And uh, the answer to that question is in a very simple question that was posed to me when I was 16. And that question was, why do we go to the movies? So come to think of it, when was the last time, I ask you, when you shut the door, switch the lights off, put your phone away, and told to the person that you love the most in your life, your spouse, your partner, and said, for the next two hours plus, not a word from me. 100% of my concentration for you. I'm there for you. When was the last time that you did that? Uh, unless you were having sex. Uh, I bet you never did that. <laughs> but yet, yet as a strange ritual, we do this in cinema halls. Week after week, we go into a dark room, lock ourselves up, and not speak a word for two hours. Why? And the answer that was given to me at that time was, that cinemas are emotional gymnasiums. Just like we go to a gym, because we, there are lots of muscles in our body that don't get exercise due to our daily life. Our, our life doesn't give us that opportunity. Similarly, we have a lot more emotions that we can experience, which our daily life does not give us the opportunity for. Uh, after all, most of us don't hang off cliffs. Uh, a lot of us are hoping that we won't find our spouses in bed with our best friend. But strangely enough, we want to know, how would that feel? And we go to the movies. In fact, in, fact uh, in the Art of Dramatic Theory, a book called Natya Shastra, written about 3,000 years ago by Bharat Muni in ancient India, the nine rasas, or the mental states or emotions, were captured by him as to these are the variety of emotions that a human being wants to experience, and how can dramatic theory provide that? And these are love, attraction, laughter, fury, compassion, mercy, disgust, horror, heroism, wonder, tranquility. But let's push this a little further. Why do we want to experience all of this? Why? And for this, I turn to an ageless question that Aristotle posed to us thousands of years ago in his book Ethics, which is, how should a human being lead his life? And for, for, for centuries, since time immemorial, we seek to answer this ageless question. But this answer eludes us, hiding behind a blur of racing hours as we struggle to fit our means to our dreams. We are swept along a risk-ridden shuttle through time. And what have we done? We turn to these four wisdoms to get the answer. Philosophy, science, religion, and art. But tell me, when was the last time you read Hegel or Kant? I bet it was when you had to pass an exam. <laughs> religion, for many of us, in its current popular misunderstood form, is nothing but empty rituals that mask hypocrisy. Science is, has advanced, but it has made life very complex and, and, and perplex. It, it, it has a perplexing, perplexing effect. And hence, we turn to art. We turn to the story, to the source that we still believe in, and that is the art of the story. In fact, judging by the ravenous appetite or hunger with which we, we now consume films, novels, plays, indeed, story art has become the prime source of inspiration for mankind. In fact, why do we do that? Because we seek order and insight into life itself. That's our way to deal with the anarchy of existence. Think about it. The number of events that happen in your life, personal events and momentous events. Small events, like you came in the MRT and somebody gave up their seat. And then later, that was the guy that got pushed and fell down. Uh, you, you see around and you find that the most idiot guy in the class gets the hottest chick. <laughs> the most mean person wins a lottery. How do you make sense of all of that? You look at the news and you see that, on one hand, we inaugurate a nuclear reactor and celebrate our achievement over science, and on the other hand, a nuclear reactor blows up. Uh, a dictator gets 
uh, gets overthrown, and another continues with rape and murder. There are so many events that happen, and as these events happen, we reflect upon them after the happening of the event to try and draw some meaning and try and answer for ourselves that ageless question, how do we lead our life in this? And this is where story gives us the fast download option, which is that as we vicariously immerse ourselves in the events that happen to a character, in a magical thing happens in a cleverly crafted story. We have the simultaneous encounter of thought and feeling. And this is something that life does not allow us. Events happen in life, we later reflect upon them. Sometimes in hours, sometimes days, sometimes it takes years to actually distill out the meaning of that and what it means about living life. In life, experiences become meaningful with reflection in time, but in art, they are meaningful now. In life, fusion of idea and emotion is so rare, when it happens, you feel like you're having a religious experience. And the second thing that's unique about story is that it gives you a direct sensory feel of truth. What do I mean by that? So consider this. If I give you this idea that we can live happily only if we are in harmony with the delicate balance of nature, you agree with the truth in this thought. But now, when I give you an emotionally charged story of Avatar, and I show you how what happens when the delicate links of nature and ecology are broken, it becomes memorable for you. An idea wraps itself around an emotional charge and it becomes more powerful, memorable, and profound. And this is what Robert McKee, the screenwriting guru, calls the controlling idea. The controlling idea of Titanic is love is what makes life worth living and what is worth dying for. The controlling idea of survival films is courage and genius of humanity will prevail over the hostility of nature. The controlling idea of Kramer versus Kramer, an ironic, bittersweet film, is that sacrifice involves pain, but love triumphs when we sacrifice our needs for others. American Beauty, compulsive pursuit of success, fame, sex, and power will destroy you. But if you realize this truth in time and throw away your obsession, you can redeem yourselves. And in the case of American Beauty, once he throws that away, even death is a feeling of lightness. Or dark ending films, where the controlling idea is if you cling to your obsession, your ruthless pursuit will achieve your desire and destroy you. Or the King's Speech, where when we cast away titles and connect as human beings, we can overcome the biggest of obstacles. Now, each of these controlling ideas can actually be the title or the subject of a philosophic paper or a mathematical scientific proof to prove each of these, or even a sermon. And in fact, as you leave the room, uh, on the table outside, you will find copies of all three. You will also find the DVDs of these movies. Take your pick. <laughs> it's for this reason that we say that films are, in fact, the most popular form of adult education. Cinema chains are the largest network of classrooms on this planet in which we study the subject of life. In fact, almost the entire humanity is in that classroom. Why? Because at heart, story is non-intellectual. It does not express its ideas in intellectual arguments of essays in, in a dry manner. The exchange between the artist and the audience is direct through a series of perception, intuition, and emotion. And coming back to myself, why do I want to do this? Because I wanted to draft some of the curriculum of humanity myself. <laughs> now, after this very Ted-worthy story of why I got into screenwriting, let me tell you the real one. It was... <laughs> it was... We got two passes for an awards night back in Mumbai for the Screen Awards. And my wife and I, we dressed up and we landed up uh, only to find that in this gigantic stadium where this awards were going to be held, open air stadium, our seats were second from the last row. And the security, the, the, rather, the crowd control experts showed us our place duly. <laughs> On that night, I told my wife, I want to be famous. I want to be in the front. I want to live beyond my years on this planet. Because people die, stories don't. So I took the jump. 
I went on a part-time program with my consulting firm and started the double role of my life. How was it? Well, I figured out that indeed my years on this planet, uh, 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 I will definitely live beyond my years on this planet, but my years on the planet would be rather tough. <laughs> you see, a novelist is paid per, book of the, uh, per copy of the book that he sells. A copywriter is paid per line. A journalist is paid per word. A screenwriter is paid per haps. <laughs> But you see, money is not everything. You know, all of us agree that a writer's job is a very important job, right? Do we? Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, so uh, you remember the pain of bad writing, you know, when you got into the seat and from the first minute you knew that how this is going to end and how painful it was to really go through it. And of course, the engagement that you felt when there was a great, nicely written movie and so on and so forth. So think about your three favorite movies, quick. OK, three favorite actors. OK, three favorite directors and three favorite writers. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured out that fame was not the right reason to be in this profession. In fact, at the premiere of my own film, um, the security guys insisted on seeing my pass. <laughs> I think it was the same crowd control expert they'd hired. <laughs> But listen, it wasn't as if this double role was without any uh, interesting moments. There were interesting moments. Like, I turned up on the first day uh, and uh, with a very hour-by-hour -hour agenda as we're used, in our used to in our corporate life uh, with this very famous writer. Uh, and then I found he had his own agenda. <laughs> a producer asked me for my opinion on a script. And like a good consultant, I turned up with a 60-page PowerPoint deck. I was duly fired. Um, anyways, two movies and an award nomination later, McKinsey came calling, and I shifted from Mumbai to Singapore. I continue to write. It's painfully slow. I have two sons, one wife, all full-time, and a full-time job. <laughs> but why do I do it? Why do I do it? Is it that my clients like me more? Uh, this is what was the expression when I was introduced as a Bollywood screenwriter in one of the Singapore ring companies. Uh, he said, it's all about dancing, isn't it? And I said, yes. Just like, just like being a coach of a baseball team is all about choreographing cheerleaders. Anyways, are people excited to see me? Yes. In fact, this Malay man was really excited. He was about to kiss me when I met him in an SBS transit bus. <laughs> it was overwhelming, I tell you. Uh, until he said, <laughs> and I said to him, yes, indeed, up close and personal. <laughs> well, does it at least make me popular with family and friends? Yes, of course. I get lots of uncles calling me uh, and telling that they have a great idea for a for next movie of mine. And I ask what? They say it's their life. <laughs> So clearly, it's not about all of this. So what is it that I still continue to write? To me, it is my connect back to India. To me, it is my connect to Indian people and Indian stories. I'm a great believer in that story, in the story of India. And Indian stories are changing. Mainstream Bollywood ch stories are changing. And I'm not talking about some parallel small movement that's happening. Sample some of these. So this is Lage Rahu Munna Bhai. These are the top blockbusters of the last five years. Okay. This is when a gangster falls in love with the caretaker of an elderly home. And then he hallucinates that Gandhi talks to him. And how he undergoes a transformation and wins his beloved over by having a non-violent struggle against those gangsters who are going to take over this elderly home and wins his beloved under the guidance of none other than Gandhi himself. Rangde Basanti, where four wayward youths find their calling when they act out in the amateur uh, in an amateur film, the roles of revolutionaries and so on. Um, that is Amin Pei, where uh, an, an, uh, when an art teacher gets the inspiration out in an autistic student and makes him sort of inspired and, and realize his potential. Three Idiots, where the son of a gardener joins a, the best engineering college and 
challenges the foundations of the education system and goes on to actually have his fellow students and professors actually discover their true passion and becomes a school teacher and a venture capitalist. And so on. I could have more examples, but the time there is running out. So where is Bollywood and Hollywood today? Uh, as per Time magazine, uh, Bollywood today has a global audience of 3.6 billion compared to 2.6 billion of Hollywood. It produces 1,000 films as against 500 of Hollywood. Yes, it makes more money, uh, but guess what? Who owns 50% of Steven Spielberg's DreamWorks? It's Anil Ambani of India. <laughs> so what's my point? My point is that I was, as we go to the future, as we go to the future, um, I make some bold assertions. In this Asian century, the face of entertainment will change. Stories told and watched by kids and the kids of your kids will change. Hollywood will continue to thrive, but Asia will find its voice and its rightful place in the world and in the world of storytelling. Asia will not have to look for its heroes westwards. Asia will tell its stories and the world will listen. Many of those stories will be Indian and I want to make sure some of those are mine. <laughs> yes. I do want to live beyond my years on the planet. And the mechanism that I have chosen is cinema. But that's about me. My point is about the power of story. In my day job now as a leadership consultant, I interact with senior leaders. And the best that I have seen use story to make meaning for themselves and for people around them. So as I leave, I ask you, what story are you creating for yourself? What stories are you telling to people around you? What controlling idea of life do your stories tell other people? Are they uplifting? Are they inspiring? Are they memorable? What meaning will your kids derive from the stories you told them? Because when you're gone, your life story will reflect the controlling idea of your life. And borrowing from Ted's tagline, I ask you, would it be an idea worth spreading? Thank you.